So this work of art is the AGO's own Shop Girl by James Tissot. We start the exhibition right off the bat with one of the most beloved works in our collection. So the way that I like to think of this painting is not so much that we are a customer exiting her shop, which on the one hand we are, but I also like to think of this painting as us entering the streets of Paris. This is all art. Uh, from the second half of the 19th century. And it was a time of great change in France. And this painting behind me by James Tissot, uh, the shop girl, shows a lot of the changes that, that occurred in Paris at this time. Uh, the plate glass, the window, uh, that didn't exist beforehand. So window shopping, um, the street outside, the wide avenues in Paris, that was brand new. It was a medieval city before with narrow lanes. And I'm going to say here, but just turning over that way, you can see in the painting in the center there, that's a bird's eye view of new Paris. We have this wide boulevard slicing down and ending with a view of the Paris Opera. And the photograph to the right is actually taken right from the middle of that boulevard before the reconstruction and renovation projects occurred. And so you can see all of those buildings would have been demolished to make way for these large boulevards leading up to these grand vistas. The opera itself was only just completed right during the time of the original Impressionist exhibitions. It was still underway during the first Impressionist exhibition. And so the two works to the left show the opera, the neighborhood on the left, and the opera under construction in a gorgeous photograph uh, immediately to the left of the painting. So this exhibition looks at the Impressionists, the Impressionists looking at the time they were living in. And it was a gritty time. It was a time of war, the Franco-Prussian War, it was a time of the Commune, it was a time of all sorts of disturbance and change, and yet they, they managed to make these beautiful paintings. So here we've entered the gallery dedicated to trains, and immediately when you walk into this room, we hope you get the sense of the thrill and dynamism of train travel. Trains allowed people to access ever further destinations ever faster. And so the works that you see in this room, many of them capture that feeling of a rush of movement. So what I most want to draw your attention to here in this room is this masterpiece by Gustave Kaibot behind me. Kaibot was key to the Impressionist movement. He was right there with Monet and Degas. He was essential to planning their original exhibitions and even funding them. And this is one of his three greatest masterpieces that has come to Toronto for this exhibition. It tells a lot about the age. This is a bridge, and behind the bridge, it's in Paris, behind the bridge is Gare Saint-Lazare. So you, when you look at this, you might think that it is a true view of this bridge, but in fact, he's put three views together, he's manipulated it. Uh, the iron, the actual railings, would have been waist height, not as big. So what he's referring to is the Franco-Prussian War. Battles were fought on this bridge. So anybody at the time looking at this painting, the iron would have meant, for them, would have meant munitions and war rather than industry and development. The Eiffel Tower was built many years later. Um, and he's manipulated this view because on, on one side you see Osman was Baron Osman who developed Paris, who did the urban planning and was responsible for the Paris we know today. So on this side of the painting you can see the buildings and the wide boulevard. So that's a sort of utopian version of the Paris. And on this side it's more disturbing. Uh, there are all sorts of hidden things in it. This, the train over there, uh, the, the, the government at the time were in Versailles. That was a train that went every day. These people look as if they're walking together, but in fact they're not. Kayabot is referring to when you have change, you have war, you have rapid development, rapid change. You also have anxiety. And that's what he's got embedded in that painting. And I think it's always interesting to think about a painting, how a painting would be received at the time it was painted by people who knew the area, knew the time. And we look at it now and you wouldn't get any of that just by looking at it. You would take it at face value. Welcome to the factory section. 
So this is the third of our great three symbols of industrial progress in this exhibition. And in this gallery, what we see, the impact of factories on the landscape, but also the people in those factories staffing them. Now we also see inside the factories to the workers who were there. Um, I love our example here where we have a miner in a helmet in a lithograph print on the left and he uh, very happily is staring down, happily for me as the curator, maybe not happily for these two gentlemen, uh, they're staring down each other, they're facing off. Um, he is looking into the eyes of a factory owner and that factory owner is named Henri Rouault and he was a good friend of Degas who painted this portrait. Several of the artists in this exhibition, Pissarro, Camille Pissarro, and this artist, Maximilian Luce, were actually anarchists. They were artists who were really concerned about the conditions of the workers. He actually went to a factory in Belgium and with these iron workers, steel workers, and he was just absolutely horrified at the conditions they were working in, which you can see in this painting. Uh, behind you, that's uh, one of the earliest films, again, by the Lumiere brothers, where workers are streaming out of the factory at the end of the day. And it's wonderful to see, it's a lot of women this, in this factory, and fascinating to see the dress that they have. So, and then lastly, kind of leading us into the next section, we have a painting of rag pickers by Jean-Francois Raffaelli. Raffaelli is another artist who may be less well known, uh, but he was deeply interested in the plight of workers. He lived in this industrial suburb called Anier and painted the people. He got to know them as individuals. You can even see their faces recurring in different compositions that he made of rag pickers. A rag picker was a profession of a trash collector in an era before the trash can was invented. The trash can was invented right in this era in France by a man named Mr. Poubelle, thus the French name of a trash can. And uh, there was some concern when the trash can was invented that it would put rag pickers out of work. It was, um, Raffaelli has painted these workers in a way that makes them appear monumental because their bodies break the horizon line. And in that way, the kind of dignity and individuality that we sense from them, that's how he achieves that, by making them break the horizon line and really tower over us. And so there's a certain dignified, respectful way in which he's portrayed uh, the very hard work of these individuals. This is a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Um, he did it in 1887, and its factory is in Clichy, which is just outside Paris. He was living in Paris at the time. And, I mean, it's a stunning painting. But what's really interesting to me is it's, it's completely, it's factories. Um, so the artists were celebrating factories. They were celebrating progress. This was exciting for them. Because if I was doing a painting, I particularly wouldn't choose to put smokestacks. So, you know, they are very determinedly going out to find these scenes. But what I love in this painting is in the middle here, you see one or two people um, very intentionally put in the middle there. And previous generations of artists, there was a, a sort of romantic movement where they would have a small person in front of nature, Caspar David Friedrich, for example. And, and he's done that. He's put these people intentionally there in front of these overpowering factories. Anyway, it's a stunning painting. We're lucky to get it. So this section is one of the, is the first of the two sections where we step outside of the industrial sphere to see what's going on kind of behind the scenes. And so we have several works here by Degas. We have actually five right in this section. And particularly right here, we have a focus on the female workers. So for one, we have the laundresses who ironed the white collared shirts that graced the shoulders of men like Henri Rouault, the factory owner that we already saw. This is all part of a larger industry that we want to illustrate in this section, which is the textile industry. We begin with the processing and selection of raw cotton in the painting behind you by Degas. And then we see that cotton, it would have been processed in factories and then ironed by laundresses. And finally, it would have been those very shirts that get picked up in the end by rag pickers that we have here. So this Degas painting is a really stunning example of the work of the laundress, the woman ironing, who did the white-collared shirts. 
White collared shirts were considered the most difficult and skilled for workers to iron because of how hard it was to get that crisp collar. And he shows her on the one hand surrounded by this symphony of colors. Those colored garments that are covering the windows have this light shining through and Degas relishes in that translucence and color that comes through. It's a beautiful painting of a really uncomfortable space. It would have been hot and steamy and just really a not fun place to be, but Degas makes it beautiful. It's not just about that beauty and aesthetics though. He also shows her engrossed in her labor, showing her as a skilled craftswoman, just as he himself is skilled, a skilled artist in completing this painting. Another theme we have in this section is domestic labor, remembering the women who would have been in the homes of perhaps the factory owners caring for their children. And so here we have in the AGO's own Degas painting, a woman helping, um, helping this bather bathe in an era before plumbing. You would have needed household labor in order to carry the water, heat the water, and bathe in such a large porcelain tub. We also have this painting by Mary Cassatt, where she is something, she would maybe be read by our modern eyes today as a mother, but period eyes would have understood her through her clothes to be a nanny. So again, we have a domestic worker, and it offers us a really invaluable perspective on female labor from a woman artist. So we're thrilled to have this work in the show. The next section that we're going to make our way through, and then we'll stop right after it, the next section is rural labor. And we wanted to show this, as I mentioned, to keep in mind the agricultural technologies on farms and in orchards that sustained the growing cities from afar. There was technology happening in, in the farms in the countryside as well, but also the young avant-garde generation cropping up in the 1880s and 90s had this yearning to escape the industrial city. They wanted to get out. They were in search of what they thought of as a more authentic way of life. And so painting the countryside became a really a very avant-garde subject for them. And especially in the three works on this feature wall we have here, um, you see these young artists who are venturing out in search of something new and different. So we are thrilled to have been able to bring together the three Monets that you see here. It's really powerful for us to be able to end the exhibition on this note. Before I get to them, I just want to make our way around this room. This gallery is a peek at what life was like in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. So in Paris, we have the city hosting the World's Fair again. And we see, so the 1900 World's Fair is when the Eiffel Tower, built 11 years earlier, is now becoming an iconic symbol of Paris. You have the world coming to Paris, and you also have Paris looking out to the rest of the world. Thomas Edison goes there to make these films of the Eiffel Tower at the World's Fair. And it's really this cosmopolitan moment for Paris where um, Art Nouveau uh, is cropping up. You have Toulouse-Lautrec performing in cafe concerts. It's what we really like to think of as turn of the century, fin de sec Paris. At the same time, Monet leaves that scene and makes several trips to London. And when he goes to London for these trips, it's the first time that he returns to industrial subjects since he painted the Guerre Saint Lazare painting that we opened the exhibition with. So he took a 23 year break from industrial subjects and he returns to them in London. And I think that's poignant that he does it not in France, but in London, in the city that's so famous for its industrial revolution, but also infamous for its smog. So these paintings, uh, the subject, we have on the far left the Waterloo Bridge with factories in the distance, and then the middle and right are Charing Cross Bridge, which is a railway bridge, and on this painting we can see a train crossing. The real subject of these that people, art historians, most like to talk about, though, is the atmosphere and the smog. It's that dazzling light that Monet is genius in capturing. And what's really amazing about these works is the different ways that he achieves that across all three. So in the painting on the left, what's so amazing to me is the subtlety of the different color gradations. There's very few colors that he used to make that painting, and yet we still read it as a multi-dimensional bridge with traffic crossing it and factories in the background. On the other hand, this painting is almost the opposite in, a, in the way that it achieves that. We have the shimmering effect of light on the water 
through these really thick yellow brush strokes. And some of that shimmer actually comes from the shadows cast by the brush strokes themselves because they're so thick. So it's really a literally three-dimensional way of experiencing the light that he's captured in this glittering landscape. And the third painting in the center is the AGO's own work. So again, this is an incredible example of being able to place our collection truly in its context. So the smog that he's capturing here was actually an example of industry literally infiltrating the atmosphere. The smoke belching out of the factories was infusing the air, and that is what created these dazzling atmospheric effects that he so sought after and wanted to capture in these many series of paintings. One thing that was really interesting researching this exhibition, research, researching Paris at the time this art was made, and say from 1860 to 1900, was how many similarities it seemed to me there were with Toronto now. It was a time of great change, of great development. So in the middle of the exhibition, we have an area for visitors to respond and think about Paris then and Toronto now. So we have a map on the wall over here, and it's Baron Oseman who did this grand design of Paris and, and moved the small medieval streets, put great big boulevards with sight lines and so on. There were several reasons why he was doing this. Some of it was strategic because you can march armies and stop you know, revolutions if you have wide streets. And some of it was to give what he would say would be to give light and air and you know, parks and spaces and magnificent buildings. And it is the Paris we know today. So then we started thinking about Toronto, and of course we've got our CN Tower here. And we started thinking about all the changes in Toronto and the challenges, and that it's an exciting time we live in. But it's also an anxious time we live in, and there are many problems that we still have to resolve. Affordable housing, transportation, all exactly the same things that the Impressionists were painting and, and were facing at the time. We end the show with this moment where Paris is becoming a cosmopolitan city, Monet is making several trips to London, and it's at the turn of the century, and so we like to think of people being able to exit the show, think about the future impacts of what we've seen here, and the relevance to the streets of Toronto or their own city in life today.